as I see this, I can hand off the torch to the next generation. We see the youth who have been able to follow and sacrifice and work with us. So we give our great, great gratitude to the next generation and those yet to come in. Always seven generations down. Always look seven generations down. So mahalo for this time. Thank you. Thank you. So what's interesting is that you know, for 25 years we've been serving um, youth as far as fostering and adopting and we become um, certified trainers for parents and for children that grew up in a traumatic environment. And we've been also into the hemp movement. A lot of people are kind of shying away from that. But when you study it, you find that the Hawaiians, we had hemp, we used to give hemp as um, gifts to the pastors and stuff. Things that made, were made of hemp and actual hemp plants. So we were into that training about two, three years ago and now they have passed that we can now process and manufacture hemp. So hemp has no um, THC, so you don't get high. You just you can make over 15,000 um, textiles and things that you can derive from. You can make toilet paper. You can make lumber products. So we will be actually be able to make two by fours, paneling, flooring, walls, um, toilet paper. We will actually kind of move away from maps and our dependence on uh, things that coming in from the mainland, you know, uh, imports. We can actually be, again, be a major exporter of Hawaiian products, wow. whether it be... Don't forget food. Food, yeah, yeah get food. You can make pancakes, uh, all kinds of stuff. The hemp seeds, you eat it with the cereals, like granola. It's and just, the la'au, la'au. And la'au with the CBD, we can keep our family healthy. So this is gonna, once this gets signed and passed, you're gonna see one remarkable change in our economic landscape in Hawaii. And it's gonna benefit, to me, we wanna benefit first the Hawaiians that are on the homestead land, who are on the list, but when they get to the list, they cannot afford to buy a home. So we're gonna try to make it affordable Without the import prices, we can chop the prices down 40 to 50%. You yeah. And if you have land, you can grow your own hemp. You can process the hemp and we can give you the material. Whatever you grow, you grow one acre, you come in, we process it for you, you can stop building your own home. Or we, we're gonna have uh, schools where teach you electric, electrical, plumbing, everything in the trade. We're gonna be training up all people. And then they can go out and help others and pay it back to everybody. And then when the Hawaiians are taking care, we're going to take care of everybody. So Han Sator looking to get on board, planning of the big people that get on board. Because this is going to revolutionize uh, Hawaii's economic structure. And the Pacific Rim. And all of the other uh, Samoa, uh, New Zealand, they're all looking for this green, sustainable, a type of economy and this is the cutting edge if believe me this is gonna be the the revolutionize Hawaii we're gonna be a number one on the map and when you look at the numbers for economic growth it's off the chart it's like almost unbelievable the kind of impact it's gonna have so with all that I like to say that the Lord has prepared all of us 25 years Around 30, 40 years, everybody, Scotty, we all have been serving for free, for serving the people. And now the Lord has opened an avenue that we can actually be effective for the people of Hawaii. But we like taking the Hawaiians first, because you know, the land was right. taken away. Right. It's not using being used correctly today. We Hawaiians is just a pawn in, in one game, but we don't like that. We like serve the people. That's the bottom line. We like take bureaucracy out of it. And just show the pure love and pure heart to help the people. So with that, pray on that. Pray for everything. Go smoothly still on the resource center. And it could get bigger. The FEMA might get involved. And then we might be one, you know, one place where people can come when there's a natural disasters. We're looking at water treatment, you know, like in Israel, desalination plants. I mean, we're looking at everything. It's, very encompassing. So with all of that, uh, let's bless our Torah.
Baruchu et Adonai HaMevorah Baruch Adonai HaMevorah Le'olam Ba'el Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Vachar Baru Mikol Amin Ve'enatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai Noten Naturah Noten Nabrit Adashah Noten Yeshua Abba, you have been so faithful through the ages, Lord, from the inception of humanity until now and even into the eternal order. Your love is sufficient and everlasting. So we thank you that you have uh, chosen us, Lord. Just all of us who believe today. You have chosen us from the beginning, Lord, from the prior, before the foundations of the world, Lord. You had chose us. Your mind is way beyond ours. Your thoughts are beyond ours. So we thank you that you have loved us and made a pathway that if we believe, Lord, we will enjoy the benefits of the Jewish people. So be with us as we go through your study in Yeshua's name. And we all say, Amen. Amen. So last week, um, we kind of looked at the unpardonable sin, which is a sin that no one can commit today was uh, to that nation back then, that generation that committed the unpardonable sin that they said that all of the works that Yeshua did wasn't by the world of Hafodesh. It was by actually a demonic spirit. And they said that he was demon possessed. So what they did was they found an opportunity to go public and tell everybody that he's demon possessed. And it culminated with the unpardonable sin. And what happened was a miraculous and a radical, critical change that happened to his ministry. As far as signs were concerned, they had asked for a sign. The signs now went from the nation. When he first came, all of his signs was geared toward Israel so that they would accept him and know that he was the Messiah. In fact, many times they would say, isn't he the son of David? Yeah. Huh? That's what you guys taught me. And they... <laughs> And then they changed. They changed. Once that happened, once they rejected it, he rejected them. So now when he's going to teach from far, he's going to teach only the apostles in private. In public to the multitudes, he's going to speak in parables where no one is going to understand. So the messaging of his messiahship first went to the nation and then it was cut off. And now it would be just for the apostles or individuals who have received his forgiveness. Uh, his miracles prior to this happening for all of the multitudes you didn't have to have faith in the Messiah he would heal you right the man at the pool of Bethesda man I want the pool every year at the right time and just when the, the, the spirit stirs the water I try to get in and somebody else jumps in before me what happens they had to give me put faith in Yeshua he didn't even know who Yeshua was. But from this point on, after the unpardonable sin, you would have to show faith in Yeshua in order for a miracle to happen. So when he does a miracle on someone from this point forward, he would say, tell no one. Well, previously, he would tell everybody, tell all. Go tell it to the, to the scribes. This was a sign to them. When he had healed the leper, he said, this sign of healing the leper is a sign to them because they had to do a process which had never been done for a thousand years and now they had that sign. So at first it was tell all and it was to tell no one. Initially his message was to proclaim his messiahship to Israel. And then now it says don't tell them anymore. I gave them so much light they rejected the light. No more light is allowed to them. So the teaching goes, will go from the clear teaching, they already knew what he said, what he taught, they understood it. But now he's going to be teaching in parabolic teaching. We're going to find out what parables mean. So we're going to look at um, paragraph 64 in the life of Messiah, the course of the kingdom program in the present age. So this is the parables to the public. So this is a three, uh, 
side by side looking at Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke, all of these harmonize together so you know exactly where everything is in the scope of God's plan. So it says here in Matthew 13, 1 to 3, it says, On that day, on the same day that the unpardonable sin occurred, on that same day, Jesus went out of the house, sat by the seaside, and in verse 3 it says, He spoke to them many things in parables. In verse 10 it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why do you speak unto them in parables? What does this mean? This means that prior to this occasion, he never spoke to them in parables. In fact, he never spoke to anybody in parables because it was clear, clear teaching. So the three reasons are given for the parabolic teachings. <coughs> the first one is, he says, and he answered and said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So unto the apostles, it was given them to know the mysteries of heaven and not everybody else because they had an opportunity but they had uh, rejected an opportunity so the first reason for a parable was to illustrate the truth to the disciples it goes on to them it says but to them the multitudes it is not given it says verse 12 for whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he has. So if you haven't received him, you probably gonna get less, you can be in a worse state than what you are before Jesus came. But if you have, you'll be given even more. So if you have a little insight, a little uh, wisdom from on high, the Lord is gonna give you more. Even today, when you accepted the Lord and you study, Every day he's giving you more wisdom and more understanding. So if you have, you'll be given even more. So the second reason for the parabolic teaching was to hide the truth from the multitudes. So the multitudes would gather and he would teach them. Like, huh? Prior to this, they knew exactly what he was saying. Now they're like, what? But it was to hide the truth because they had enough light to accept it. But as a nation, they rejected it. So individuals who want to press in will find the truth and they will come to the truth. Verse 14, and unto them is fulfilled the prophecy of Yeshiahu, is Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall in no wise understand. This was prophesied. That's exactly what he's saying. You're going to hear, you're not going to understand one word that the Messiah is teaching. And seeing, you shall see, but you're not going to perceive because you're going to see, like, how can he heal one guy with a withered hand or a leper or somebody born blind? How can he do that? You're not going to be able to comprehend that because now there's scales. You're not going to perceive. It says, for the people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Now, nobody uh, mistaken that. Only those guys are uh, predisposed to being dull of hearing. Even Christians can become dull of hearing, dull of working, dull of studying themselves approved. So take heart that we not become the same dull people. Their eyes they have closed, less happily they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should turn again and I should uh, heal them. So Israel as a nation rejected, they came to the point of no return three times. But Yeshua gave them three ways to come back to him. And that was through the sign of resurrection. First was the sign of Lazarus. With Lazarus, people could accept if they actually opened their eyes. With the resurrection of Jesus himself, who no other religious leader in this whole world has come back to life except Jesus. So Jesus is, again, par excellence amongst the world uh, religious leaders and understand with their heart and should turn again and I should heal them so at those points people believed but at some point during the tribulation the two witnesses will be resurrected 
And then at some point, all of Israel shall be saved because of that. So he's telling the disciples, blessed are your eyes, for they see in your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men has desired to see the things which you see and saw them not, and to hear those things which you hear and heard them not. Abraham longed for the day. He never saw it. But they had. And I think we have to. We're living in a time where we can see God's prophetic plan unfolding right before our eyes. I mean, with Israel becoming a nation and all these things happening in the world and the allies that are forming, it's never happened in the history of the world. So the third reason for parabolic teaching was to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy, which Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, um, 9 through 10. And this is uh, in Matthew 13, verse 34, it says, All these things speak Yeshua in parables unto the multitudes. And it adds, And without a parable spake he nothing to them. <coughs> hey, Yeshua, how are you doing? You know, he's going to give him a parable. <laughs> and I could just say, hey guys, how you guys? You need prayer or whatever? You know, you know, talk to them in parables. Same thing. It marks for account. It says, and which, and with many such parables, speak he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. And without a parable, speak he not unto them. But he adds this. This is the, this one you got to catch up to these little <coughs> details that Yeshua gives and you know, Dr. Fruchtenbaum's work is so detailed. You can actually comprehend every facet and detail of God's plan for us. If you can catch on, you'll be amazed. He says, but privately to his own disciples, he expounded all things. So he would teach the multitudes and they're like, what? Go in the house and he tell them exactly what he meant when he spoke in parables. So that is the three reasons, to illustrate the truth to the disciples, to hide the truth from the multitudes, and to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. So that's another tree pillared thing of this. So what's a parable? A parable is a figure of speech which teaches ethical, moral, or spiritual truth taken from everyday life and experience. So it's not a made up thing, like Aesop's fables. That's like totally made up. But these are actually real life, and in fact, real life incidents that they um, expound upon. So there are four kinds of parables in the New Testament. The first one is, what is this word name? Simile. Simile. It uses as or like. So for example, I'm sending you like sheep among wolves. You, know, you can take the word literally. <laughs> Oh, we, we become actual sheep with fur and everything. They also use a metaphor. It's a like the simile, but it doesn't use as or like. <laughs> so Yeshua says, I am the door. <laughs> Is he like a natural? Like, e -e -e -e. I am the gate of the sheep. No, but he just, it's his metaphor. <clears throat> He also uses anthropomorphism, like the hand, or just all kind of bodily um, examples. Similitude is taking common knowledge to illustrate the truth, like the women, the woman with leaven. And there's also the story type, whether true or not, to illustrate the truth. So the story of the Good Samaritan. So the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to look at this. These two terms are actually the same thing. Only Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven. It says in Matthew 13, 11, And he answered and said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But if we look at the parallel um, accounts, he says, Unto you is given the mystery of of the kingdom of God. Unto you is given in Luke's account, 
the kingdom of God. Why is that? Why, why does he use kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God? Uh, remember when we started this whole journey, we looked at the, uh, the themes that the different writers would have when they write their particular gospels. And Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience and is totally aware of the Jewish sensitivity in using the term God. So when you talk to a Jew, it's, hey, God loves you. You're like, why? Because they are offended by that, yeah, the term God. But they substitute the terms used for God. So they call him Adonai, which is Lord, or Adoshem, the Lord of the name, or Hashem, the name, or Hashemayim, the heaven, the God who hath made Hashemayim the Aritz, the heavens and the earth. So when you say the, the terms Most High God, that's the Most High God created Hashemayim the Aritz, the heavens and the earth. So when they write in English, they write G dash G D. So instead of using God, they use that because they feel if you use His name in vain, then that's blasphemous. So this is what we did. We looked at the theme of each gospel. Matthew's was Jesus the Messiah, the King of the Jews, written for the Jews. And that's why he uses the term kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God. Mark, his theme was Jesus the Messiah, the servant of Yehovah. Who well, did he write to? He wrote to the Romans. And the Romans present Yeshua as an ideal servant, like someone who you would give him an a, a order and right away, straight away, boom, that guy would go do it. Hey, go up to the rubbish. Well, like, I'm tired. The ideal servant would go, yes, sir, on it, do it. So in Mark, you would see those passages straight away, immediately. Luke. Jesus the Messiah, the Son of Man, was written for the Greeks, so he could use um, Kingdom of God, no problem. The Greeks had no um, animosity toward the word. So he had uh, no problem using the word Kingdom of God. And as far as John, his theme was Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, and was written for the church at large mostly in the dispersion and in the land. But John emphasizes the deity of Messiah. So that is why Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven because he didn't want to offend his particular demographics that he had written to. Got it? So the kingdom of God basically means God's rule over everything. God rules, everybody else rules. <laughs> so, this, so there are five facets for God's kingdom program. First, there is the universal or eternal kingdom. What the universal aspect points out is that God is in control of the universe. <laughs> Over everything, nothing is outside of his purview, whether galaxy A or down to the one single cell amoeba. Everything is under his control. Eternal, the facet means he is always in control. He was controlled before everything began, and he is in control now, and he will be in control in the eternal order. The second facet of God's kingdom program, which is that we're in today, is the spiritual kingdom. The spiritual kingdom exists in all of the believers. From Adam until today to the end. So God's rule in the heart of the believer. So it's synonymous with the church from Pentecost to the rapture. So Acts 2 until the rapture. Another facet of God's kingdom program is the theocratic kingdom. You guys know what the theocratic kingdom? God's rule. And this is God's rule over Israel, his people. So there are two stages in the theocratic kingdom. And what we're going to see, Yeshua encompasses both of them, A and B. Not in this theocratic kingdom, but in the kingdom that we're going to be in. 
the mystery kingdom. So the first is the mediatorial kingdom, which he used men. So he used the, the law of Moses as a constitution for this mediatorial um, stage in the kingdom. And it went from Moses to Samuel. And the mediatorial set the stage. He had set us up where a man can be called a God. In the book of the Lord references the judges as ye are gods. We had a nice healthy uh, discourse last week about that. And we're going to kind of go into that a little bit. And then the monarchical period went from King David to King Zedekiah. So monarchically, Yeshua will reign during the Messianic Kingdom as a monarch. So the Babylonian destruction came during the reign of King Zedekiah. And what that did was it ended the theocratic kingdom and began the times of the Gentiles. So the times of the Gentiles began after the Babylonian destruction and will go up until the Messianic Kingdom. So I just wanted to elaborate on the Hebrew word Elohim where ye are gods. The word God is used, Elohim, it's a plural, it's used in Psalm 82, verses 1 and 6, and it's a general term for God, and it is used for the true God as well as for idols. It's used for both. So Elohim is used of God's representatives, such as angels, but in the case of John, we're going to look at that shortly, and quoting Psalm 82, 6. It is a reference to the judges of Israel. So Yeshua answered them in John 10. Before they were going to stone him, they were saying he was going to, he was blaspheming. Because he said, I and the Father are one. He says, it is, is it not written in your law that I said you are gods? God himself said, you are gods. Isn't it written? So the judges were the representatives of God having his it was delegated to them, the authority of God. So by personal and direct mission, they did the very work of Elohim. So they became direct ambassadors or judges, speaking on behalf of God. So the Pharisees recognized this non-deity meaning of the word Elohim. So Yeshua made the point that if they were called gods, if they were called gods, the judges, these mere mortals were called gods. So the Lord, he had this all set up before he came. The very representatives of God, how could it be blasphemy if he claimed to be Haben Elohim, the son of God? He didn't receive transmitted authority, but he had the direct, again, the Greek word in John 1, 1 is Proston Theon. It means a face to face encounter between Father and Son. And that personal command to do the Father's work. The Father commanded Yeshua. So this is amazing. Yeshua answered in a typical rabbinic argument. So he goes from the lesser to the greater. So he argued as the lesser of the two. So if the judges could be called Elohim, the greater God, they didn't do any miraculous works, how much more can he be called the lesser, the son of the God? You guys get that? The greater is God, the lesser is God's son. Since he is the messianic person, how much more? He did all of these miracles, but they did not receive him. They called him, calling himself the son of God as blasphemous and was ready to stone him. And he was like, wait, 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 wait. He was like, wait, wait, guys. And he called him God's back then. I say, I'm the son of God. I'm not there. I'm not God's like then. I'm the son of God. And we have the likeness of God because we're made in his image. Exactly. But he's actually the son of God. 
But the judges, the judges were called what? God. They made his image, but it's not about his image. It's about his authority. They had God's authority on earth that was given to them Amen. from heaven. So the greater was God. They were gods. They did no miraculous work. How much more can I be called the lesser, the son of God? Since he is the messianic purpose. Another example of the year of gods. So remember Aaron, he was considered a god to who? Moses was considered God to Aaron. And Pharaoh, he brought God's message to them. So Moses again was less than one judge. He was a mere man to be God to Aaron and Pharaoh. So how come I cannot be the son, the son of God? Little less than a God. Even though he's the greater, but he's showing them pure logic. His logic is amazing. The children of Israel listen to Moses. Wow. The one greater than Moses is you. So why should they not listen to the Messiah? The Messiah was going to be more than Moses. They not only had his claims, but his works that proved his claims. So the standard Jewish argument from the lesser to the greater, if Moses or the judges can be called God, how much more could the Messiah be called the Son of God? The Son of God is lesser, but he's more. But he's arguing from the less. <laughs> you see that humility is amazing. This God we serve is nothing like anybody else in this world, right? No other religious leader can even come close. So this is a, a just a diagram. So the first one is the universal eternal kingdom. It's from eternity past, you go to eternity future, and it was being in the eternal state, so we'll be in eternity uh, kingdom, in, in the eternal state. Second was the spiritual kingdom. The spiritual kingdom comes from when man believes in, the, in God. So from Adam to Noah, all of those, everybody, all the way to the eternal state is where the spiritual kingdom is in the heart of man. The third type of uh, kingdom was the theocratic kingdom, which started with Moses and ended with Zedekiah. And then with the Babylonian uh, destruction, that's when the times of the Gentiles began. So the times of the Gentiles, did you see, goes from Zedekiah all the way to the Messiah, Messiah's second coming, just before the Messianic kingdom. The fourth facet of, the, of God's kingdom program is the messianic or millennial kingdom. The messianic is the Messiah's rule will rule this kingdom from Jerusalem on a throne in Jerusalem. Now as far as messianic kingdom, this is a common Jewish term which they look to the person of that kingdom. The millennial which gives us the day, the amount of days, it will last for 1,000 years. This is a common Gentile term for the length of duration of God's, uh, the one he chose in 2 Samuel, to be the king. So Jewish term, Messianic, Gentile term, Millennium. And there's some who don't believe in the millennial reign of Yeshua. All they gotta do is rip that part out of the Bible and they're good. But if they don't, they have to bow to the scriptures. So most of, most of what we know about this kingdom, the Messianic kingdom, we learn from the Old Testament. If you study Old Testament, there's so many uh, uh, passages we speak about them. And the basis of this kingdom is the Davidic kingdom. We promise a throne, a land, a person, a dynasty. And you can find that in 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles. This is exactly what Yohanan Hamadbil, John the Baptist, and Yeshua proclaimed as being at hand. This messianic kingdom was right there. And what they did? Rejected, they rejected it. So this kingdom was rejected by the generation of Yeshua's day. So we, you gotta remember that. The unpardonable sin was done by that generation. 
And that generation wasn't given a clue of when we will have it. So this is the kingdom offer was rescinded from that generation and is going to be given to the generation of the tribulation saints. And that's just where all Israel will be saved. Already. This is the king that will be reoffered and accepted by the Jewish generation in the Great Tribulation. And that's where we they will end up in Petra, in this very defensible area, Mount Seir. That was on my bucket list, and a couple years ago we had fulfilled that bucket list. Beautiful place, hot. The guy tried to tell us, these rocks are even more beautiful than the ocean. I was like, not even. But that was under my brick. I never tell a guy that. He said, like, man, this is rocks. I'm like, okay. So again, the Messianic kingdom will come after this mystery kingdom that we are in today. And we're going to see what triggered this mystery kingdom. The fifth facet is the mystery kingdom. You guys know what it is? Of course not, it's a mystery. <laughs> but it was revealed 2,000 years ago what it was. I'll put an extra. So the mystery kingdom will start once he was rejected. So when they rejected him with the unpardonable sin, that triggered this mystery kingdom. So everything is tied in tight. The body is like no more wiggle room. Mystery, what does it mean? In Ephesians 3, two, five, um, 3 verses 2 through 5, it says, If so be that you have heard of the dispensation of that grace of God, which was given me towards you, how that by revelation was made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, Whereby when you read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, and it is now being revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Ephesians 3 9 says, And to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery which for ages has been hid in God who created all things. So in, Col in Colossians, let's just read this. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which was given me toward you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which had been hid for ages and generations, but now has it been manifested to his saints. So the mystery was hid for all this time. So the church was a mystery. The church itself, the body was a mystery. So the, the Jew and Gentile would make up the body. And that's why it was a mystery. How could that be? It was hidden. So mystery, the New Testament usage means a truth unrevealed in the Old Testament, but revealed for the first time in the New Testament. So it's not like mysterious where you don't know what's going on and you're never going to find out. Mystery, man, God chose to reveal it at a certain point in time. It's progressive revelation. And we, we also study the dispensations, right? The different dispensations of the Lord. So God chose at a certain point in time to bring the Messiah and to start the church, which was a mystery. And this is where the mystery kingdom resides. So the eight mysteries of the new covenant are found in four categories. The first one is the mystery of the kingdom, which we're going to study in this mystery kingdom. The second category is the five mysteries of the church. The seven stars and the seven lampstands, the body of Messiah, which is a mystery before because the Jew and Gentile could not fellowship together. But he had taken on this middle wall of partition and now we can celebrate and worship with the Jews. Also the indwelling of the Messiah. 
So first, Adon, uh, the Father can indwell us, the Spirit, and now the indwelling of the Messiah was also a mystery. Even his bride was a mystery. And of course, the rapture. But all of these things were revealed to us. The third category was the mystery of Israel's parting, found in Romans 9. Even though God showed through Yeshua all the miracles, they rejected it. And the fourth, fourth category is the mystery of the seven pre-climactic judgments and defeat of the two satanic mysteries. So in Revelation, there is a mystery Babylon and all these mystery things, but it was revealed. So at one point in time, all of these things will be revealed and have been revealed. So the mystery kingdom, this name was based according to Mark 13, which we saw earlier. So by being called a mystery, everything about this kingdom was unrevealed, was unknown in the Old Testament, but now the Lord has chosen to reveal it to us by Yeshua. So this begins, again, like I said, it begins with the rejection of the Messiah, with the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It triggered this mystery kingdom, and it will end with the second coming, and this kingdom will not exist. So the best name to call this kingdom that we're in today is Christendom. So Christendom today are all who claim loyalty in Christ, whether you is true or not, whether you're a cult or not, you're within the pale of Christendom. So this is the present form of God's kingdom program, which he has ordained for this time. Now in Christendom, there are Oh, we can look at it on the next one. When you, you can distinguish the mystery kingdom from the other four facets of the kingdom. So how can we distinguish it from the universal or the eternal kingdom? The mystery kingdom is not eternal because it began, it was triggered by the rejection, the unpardonable sin, and it will end in the messianic kingdom. So it begins with Israel's rejection, and ends with Israel's acceptance. How can you distinguish this from the spiritual kingdom? The mystery kingdom includes both believers and unbelievers. Can you see the distinction? The spiritual kingdom are only believers in the heart of man and God's ruling in their hearts, which started from Adam and it will continue all the way into the eternal order. So the spiritual kingdom only has believers. The mystery kingdom includes both believers and unbelievers. So within the church, there can be believers and unbelievers. Okay? Sitting among us. Thank <laughs> you. Remember, they're asking, who's the traitor? Yeah. Judas is like, yeah, who's the traitor? You know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> So the mystery kingdom includes both believers and unbelievers. That's why it's called Christendom. So whether you're Mormon or Jehovah Witness, you still fall under Christendom. How is it uh, differing from the theocratic kingdom? The mystery kingdom has both Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. Not, not in the theocratic kingdom. What about the church? The church is a portion of the mystery kingdom and not the totality of it. Which is true, but most, a lot of theologians, a lot of Bible teachers say that the church is all the way the kingdom of God. All the way. But there's a point where the church ends, yeah? At the rapture. We're in heaven, hanging on. We have become the bride. And how does it differ from the Messianic Kingdom? Anybody have any shots at that? <laughs> the Mystery Kingdom is not ruled by the Messiah who is on earth and ruling from Jerusalem. Okay? So these are the distinguishing fact, uh, facets that separate the Mystery Kingdom from these um, other facets of that Kingdom. 
this is good um, delineating points, distinguishing points to have in your mind so you can actually detail things out. And it's, it's amazing that your faith gets built pretty strong when you are able to detail these things out. So let's just look at the first parable, the parable of the sword. Verse 17 says, And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? What's the point to that? The point to that is, if you don't understand this first parable, you cannot understand the rest, the other eight parables. Amen. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to be making up stuff. You're going to be allegorizing the text for days. So the mystery kingdom age will be characterized by the sowing of the gospel seed. How many of you have been spreading you guys' gospel seed? Or you guys holding them in your pocket? Huh? It's out there. We got to spread them. And we got to let the Lord give the increase. That is why this whole mystery kingdom was brought about so that all of you and all of me, we can sow the gospel seed. Sowing the gospel seed is continuing the work of Yeshua. So if you're a true studier or a believer, you're called to be not only a hearer, but a doer of the word also. So within the mystery kingdom age, there will be different preparations for the soil. So this age, and today, will be marked by opposition from the world. Is there worldly opposition against the gospel? Of course. From the flesh, do we have problems? Of course. We get a hard time taking out the gospel and spreading that, sowing that seed. Our flesh gets in the way, the world gets in the way, and the devil himself gets in the way. But the devil can only be one place at one time. But he could be super fast. Like, yeah, they might, you know, he could be fast. <laughs> but he only can be one place at a time. So it will be marked by different responses to the word. So it talks about the wayside response. This is the only response. I mean, if you read different um, uh, writers or different Bible teachers, they have different ways of saying who's saved and who's not saved. This is from a Jewish perspective, so this is a good perspective. <laughs> The first wayward response is the response of unbelief. The second one is the rocky ground response. These are believers who never mature in the faith. You guys know anyone like that? Are we that? <laughs> we cannot be that. We have to keep growing. These are believers who can study and not understand anything. Because they don't have time. They don't like even study, I think. And that's why they remain immature in their faith. But these will make it into heaven as one who just made it through the fire. You don't like me that. You like me those who will be given gifts, rewards when you get to heaven. What we do here matters. God will look at you and he goes, hey, look what you did, Dave. You never do that, you never do this. But you did this. I'm going to give you rewards for that. Do something. Christ did something. Christ put on skin so he could die for us. And you receive that. Don't receive it and say that's it. Receive it and follow under his command. Give the gospel. A thorny ground response. <laughs> These are the smart ones. Believers who fail to apply their knowledge of the word. Now these guys, they can study, they know all these scriptures, but they fail to apply it to their lives. <laughs> planning like that. They know the scriptures, they can read planning verses, but they cannot apply it to everyday living. And that's where it counts. Where the rubber meets the road, and they fail. They cannot apply the word effectively in their own lives than in the lives of others. Now the good ground response, that's the one we gotta be. Believers who learn how to apply the scriptures in their daily living, and these guys reproduce. 
How many of you led one person to the Lord last year? What about the year before? You see how we can already see where we stay. We have to inspect ourselves. We self fruit inspectors. <laughs> we inspect ourselves and how our fruit is doing. I learn scripture, I can apply it in my living, and because of that, I should be able to reproduce. Some are great, some are advantages, they can reproduce hundredfold. Or some 60, some 30, some 1, some 2. But we all got to be evangelizing and at least leading one person a year for Yeshua. That's why we're here. Um, what does this do? The parable of the seed growing of itself. He it says that he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Who is that seed scatterer? He sleeps and rises night and day, and seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, the ear, and the full grain of the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest is come. This is everything encapsulated just before Yeshua come. And this is what we're talking about now. This is the age of the sowing of the seed, which is used... Uh, the fields are white unto harvest. That's the days we're in today. And once he puts a sickle, that means he's taking us away. The two points is, this describes when somebody receives Yeshua as their Savior, they're immediately regenerated. They immediately become born again because of a simple gospel message. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. If you believe that, you have eternal life. That's dedication. Amen. <laughs> you don't need to get rededicated or re -saved. Once you saved, it's like once you're born, you cannot get unborn. Hallelujah. Even if my son Nathan said, I reject you, Dad. I disown you. He's still get my DNA. <laughs> Sorry. You know what I mean? You still get the DNA of your father. So even if you try to reject him, nothing can separate you if you're actually born again. Hallelujah. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And you're a thing. So not even you. So what's believed can instantaneous regeneration instantly give you eternal life. I mean, just like the thief on the cross. Instantly he can be with Jesus in paradise. The same picture, like Midrash, same thing. He can be instantly. The seed springs to life of its own accord. It has its own inner power. Yeshua comes into us, and that seed blossoms. But we're going to talk about Certain seeds they're gonna get taken away. But this seed can produce life and life more abundant if we tap into this. Let me see. Let me see what it is. Okay, let's just go through this last scene. The parable of the tears. Another parable set before him, them saying. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that sowed good seed in his field. But while the man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, also among the wheat, and went away. But when the blade break sprang up, brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Why then has it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. And the servant says unto him, Will you then that we go and uh, go out there and gather them up, pull out all these tears? But he says, No. This happily when you gather up the tears, you ruin up the wheat with them. So if you pull up some unbelievers from the church, some of the believers might, might follow along. Let both go together to the harvest, and in time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather up first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them 
but gather the wheat into my barn. Remember we looked at the, um, earlier when uh, Yeshua will judge with fire? That's the fire he was talking about. The fire that the unbelievers would take and he will burn up the tears. But as far as the wheat, they will be gathered into the barn of the Messianic kingdom. So this reaffirms that passage that we had studied earlier. So tears, we studied this earlier, that it was a uh, darnel. Darnel is what it's called. So true sowing, that when you sow and see, go get one. <coughs> true imitated counter sow. People who vie and steal for this um, seed. And as a result, there's going to be a side-by-side -side development of this system. So the judgment at the end of the mystery kingdom will separate the righteous and the unrighteous. Those who are going to fire and those who will be gathered unto Yeshua. So the ultimate character of the sowing is seen. Either you're fruitful or you're unfruitful. Or you're fruitless. The last one, I think this is the last one. It's the 60. Oh, let's just stop here. It's 3 o'clock already. If you can, start to like, in your head, plot out things. When the rapture happened, when this happened, that happened. Your Bible study will be so amazing and your, not pride, but your confidence in knowing that you and God are teaming up to form this uh, picture in your mind. And it's, it's easy to dispense to others. It's easy to throw the seed out. But until you can do that, it's, it's hard. You can be all over the place. You're scared about, oh, do I have the answer? The right answer is you give them my gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. You believe that? You have eternal life. That's easy to remember. Everything else is added. That's all you need to get saved. So with that, I'm um, going to share us a prayer, and then we're going to do a song to put us into the mood for uh, communion. Father, we cannot help but fall on our knees and show our appreciation for your willingness and your heart of love to show us your full plan and that we might be able to see your love and your splendor and your glory. We didn't have to wait for the kingdom, but we can see it now as we study ourselves approved. But as we begin to set our minds and our hearts upon the things that you've done for us, as we do receive the cup and the bread, Lord, that represents you and your willing for sacrifice on our behalf, your enemies. <laughs> While we were yet enemies, Lord, you died for us. So we thank you for loving us while we were your enemies.
Grab the elements and we'll do a communion outside. Yeshua's name. 